Welcome. I'm Tim Curry, the Deputy Associate Director for Accountability and Workforce Relations at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. On January 22, 2021, President Biden signed Executive Order 14003 on protecting the federal workforce. Section 1 of EO 14003 provides that it's the policy of the United States to encourage union organizing and collective bargaining. The president strongly believes that it's critical for workers to have their voices heard in the workplaces, and the key to doing this is encouraging worker organizing and collective bargaining. To help advance this policy objective, Section 4 of the EO provides that the head of each agency, subject to the provisions of Chapter 71 of Title V, United States Code, shall elect to negotiate over the subjects set forth in 5 U.S.C. 7106 B1 and shall instruct subordinate officials to do the same. The subjects under Section 7106 B1 are more commonly referred to as permissive topics of bargaining. Historically, agencies have been able to elect to bargain or not over these topics. However, as part of the president's goal to reset labor management relations in the executive branch, it is now executive branch policy for agencies to collectively bargain over these topics. On March 5th, 2021, OPM released guidance to agencies concerning implementation of the executive order. This includes guidance on executive branch policy to engage in collective bargaining on topics under Section 7106B1. The OPM guidance outlines five key principles agencies should follow in implementing their requirements to engage in bargaining on these matters. I'm going to cover these five principles today. So first, Agency and union representatives will bargain over Section 7106B1 subjects in good faith with the objective of reaching an agreement. Second, in the event that the parties are unable to reach an agreement, either party may seek the assistance of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, or FMCS, as well as any other mutually agreed upon dispute resolution process in accordance with 5 U.S.C. 7119A. Every effort should be made to reach agreements that address the interests of both parties. Third, if FMCS assistance does not result in an agreement, either party may, in accordance with 5 U.S.C. 7119B, take the impasse to the Federal Service Impasses Panel to resolve the impasse or to an arbitrator agreed upon by the parties to resolve the impasse under procedures approved by the panel. Fourth, in the event of an agency head review of a panel ordered resolution, the agency may not disapprove the panel ordered resolution because it's a 7106B1 subject. And finally, in order to implement the policies of the executive order, agencies shall agree to bargain over the substance of 7106B1 subjects, whether at the union's request, for example, a midterm bargaining request, or as a result of a proposed agency action, for example, a union responded to an agency notice of a pending change subject to collective bargaining. In other words, the requirement to bargain on 7106B1 subjects is not limited to collective bargaining over new term collective bargaining agreements. Since the law generally provides agencies the discretion to elect to bargain or not on permissive subjects, there isn't necessarily a lot of experience across government negotiating on these subjects. Since it's now executive branch policy, to elect a bargain on the 7106B1 subjects, we are partnering with our colleagues at the Federal Labor Relations Authority to provide this overview training on what it means to bargain on the subjects covered by 5 U.S.C. 7106B1. Since collective bargaining on topics covered by 5 U.S.C. 7106B1 must be considered together with the topics covered by 5 U.S.C. 7106A, this overview training will provide some background on 7106A subjects as well. The FLRA will cover the statutory requirements and related FLRA decisions, and OPM will address any policy questions that may arise during this training. Therefore, I will now turn it over to Bill Kirstner to begin. Bill has worked in the Dallas and Boston regional offices of the FLRA and currently serves as a regional attorney in the Washington regional office. His overview of bargaining will help provide context to 7106B1. Bill, over to you. Tim, thank you for that introduction. The Federal Labor Relations Authority is pleased to be partnering with OPM to present this training and to provide statutory context for President Biden's Executive Order 14003. As background, 
The Federal Labor Relations Authority is an independent federal agency which administers the Labor Management Relations Program for 2.1 million non-postal federal employees worldwide, approximately 1.2 million of whom are represented in over 2,200 bargaining units. The FLRA is charged with providing leadership and establishing policies and guidance related to federal sector labor management relations and with resolving disputes under and ensuring compliance with the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, which is found at 5 U.S. Code Chapter 71. A copy of the statute is available at flra.gov. A couple of housekeeping items. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the four presentations. If you are participating through WebEx, please feel free to use the private chat box to send in questions. If you are participating through YouTube Live, you can email in questions to eotrainingquestions at flra.gov. That's E-O-T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G-Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S at flra.gov. Lastly, there will be 10 minute breaks at the end of each of the next three presentations. Given the FLRA's role in adjudicating labor disputes, these materials and this presentation do not represent general legal advice to the listener. Later disputes related to matters discussed in today's training may be presented to the FLRA for independent review and adjudication. Please therefore consider these materials as information to help you understand the statute the FLRA enforces and the rights and obligations it creates. As cases often turn on the unique set of facts and circumstances, it is just not possible to create a training that will allow the listener to predict all outcomes. Further, even expert practitioners acknowledge that this area of the law is complex. If this is your first exposure to these concepts, you may want to listen to today's presentations from the FLRA YouTube page several times, as the terms and concepts may need to be absorbed over time. Lastly, FLRA.gov contains additional resources to help you further explore this area. The FLRA enforces the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, but for the purposes of this training, we'll just call it the statute. You can find a searchable copy of the statute on our website. This is a pocket-sized version. Opening it up on page three, the congressional findings are listed. It is noteworthy that Congress found that unions and bargaining in the federal civil service is in the public interest. These findings are unchanged since the statute was enacted in 1979. Bargaining is a method of obtaining input and buy-in from employees through their exclusive representatives on matters that impact their work. So the statute gives employees the right to have or not have a union. Further, in section 7102, it notes that employees through chosen union representatives have the right to negotiate agreements about conditions of employment. This is the start of understanding the idea of scope of bargaining, meaning the topics included and excluded from collective bargaining. Before we continue to examine what is on and off the proverbial bargaining table, we first, however, need to touch on when bargaining may occur. The statute and authority cases interpreting it establish three traditional times when bargaining may occur. First, term bargaining for a master agreement. Second, midterm bargaining during the time when the agreement is in place over matters not addressed in or covered by existing agreements. The authority issued a 2020 policy statement which noted, the statute neither requires nor prohibits midterm bargaining. Instead, the statute leaves midterm bargaining obligations to the parties to resolve as part of their term negotiations. And the third time, which is before changes are implemented with some exceptions. While not the focus of this training, parties need to remember that bargaining does not have to occur at all times over all possible subjects that could be negotiated. Thus, these concepts limit when parties may have the right or duty to bargain. 
It is critical that you keep the idea of when bargaining may occur in mind, as even if a union submits negotiable B-1 proposals, if they are submitted at a time when the union doesn't have a right to bargain, the agency may lawfully decline to bargain. Further, even when it is a time when the duty to bargain exists, proposals can be outside of the duty of bargaining for a variety of reasons, including being unlawful, being contrary to government-wide regulation, being contrary to agency rules for which there is a compelling need, or being too focused on non-unit employees such as supervisors, employees in other units, unrepresented employees, or end users of your agency's services. Turning away from the issues of when bargaining may or must occur to the topics and subjects that may be included in bargaining, the statute includes several limits on the matters that may be negotiated. These must be understood before we discuss Section 7106 and Section 7106B1. In the statute's definition section, Section 7103A14, the statutory definition of conditions of employment itself removes several topics from the bargaining table. These include bargaining over political activities, such as using government time or resources to campaign. Also excluded is bargaining over the classification of any position. While it matters greatly if an employee's position is classified as a GS-12 or a GS-13, the union may not negotiate over that. Further, in Section 7103A14C, the union is not entitled to bargain over matters that are specifically provided for by federal statute. This last one, Section 7103A14C, includes many, many matters. For most federal employees, this includes pay, pensions, insurance, annual and sick leave, travel and move benefits, so very much of what represents many of the most important matters bargained in the private sector. In the federal sector, these are off the table because they are specifically provided for by federal statute. Further, Section 7103A14C has broader implications on the scope of bargaining beyond removing matters such as pay that are covered by other laws. Because 5 U.S.C. Chapter 71 what I'm referring to the statute is a federal statute, it in section 7106 further addresses and clarifies the scope of bargaining and thus has the ability to impact the scope of bargaining. Thus, finally, we need to examine section 7106. This is a picture of two pages of the pocket statute book. The two pages that include all of section 7106. Let's spend a moment looking at all of Section 7106, which in my experience underpins the biggest mistakes typically made by some in labor and management as relates to bargaining. So as we study Section 7106, I'll point out these common misreads. From the 10,000 foot level, looking down on Section 7106, you will see it has an A section and a B section. And the very first sentence in Section 7106A states that A is subject to subsection B. And that means all of A is subject to all of B. Since you all want to get to the discussion of B1, and B1 is part of subsection B, that means all of A is subject to B1 and B2 and B3. But again, let's go back to 7106A. As you can see, section 7106A is titled Management Rights. And the rights listed in A include the right to hire, fire, assign, the right to suspend, remove, determine the agency's mission, budget, organization, number of employees, deal with internal security practices, to lay off, to contract out. It is a very broad list that in toto represents management being management. And I think that is the source of one of the biggest mistakes management can make when Section 7106A is misread to mean that the union has no role when management rights under 7106A are being exercised. That is incorrect because the exercise of A rights 
are subject to 7106B. If A didn't start off with a clause subject to subsection B, there would be much less bargaining in the federal government. However, A is subject to B, and that means we need to look at B each and every time management exercises at 7106A management rights. So let's now turn to section 7106B of the statute. Again, from 10,000 feet, section 7106B has three parts. B1 covers what are traditionally considered permissive subjects of bargaining. B2 addresses bargaining over procedures when management exercises 7106A management rights. And B3 covers bargaining over appropriate arrangements. Let's start by looking more closely at B1. That subsection starts off with the clause at the election of the agency. It is noteworthy and significant that that clause is missing from B2 and B3. Traditionally, the clause at the election of the agency has meant that agencies could bargain B1 proposals and matters if they chose to do so, but if they don't, they don't have to. We call B1 bargaining permissive, which means bargaining over B1 matters under the statute has been solely at the agency's discretion. Now, B2 and B3 do not have included the clause at the election of the agency. As a result, these two provisions that authorize bargaining over procedures and appropriate arrangements for affected employees, and we typically call this impact and implementation bargaining, is not permissive. Instead, this bargaining is mandatory. This B2 and B3 bargaining is the source of the vast majority of the bargaining that historically occurs in the federal government. But this bargaining is not over the substance of the decision to exercise a management right, say to conduct a reduction in force, but instead over appropriate arrangements and procedures for adversely affected employees. Again, with a RIF example, the proposals should not be don't conduct the RIF because the agency has a section 7106A right to conduct a reduction in force. Instead, proposals may be about timing or include attempts to reduce the impact on affected unit employees. Examples of possible B2 or B3 proposals include proposals addressing priority hiring, retention rights, or bump and retreat rights for employees impacted by the RIF. These can be impact and implementation proposals, and when management exercises a Section 7106A management right, this B2 and B3 bargaining is mandatory. There is a category of matters that do not implicate Section 7106A management rights. These few matters are substantively negotiable because they have been held not to impact the exercise of Section 7106A management rights. These include union official time, union access to agency internet and bulletin boards, and traditionally parking. Also, the Alternative Work Schedules Act makes AWS fully and substantively negotiable. The right to negotiate over the substance of a matter expands the nature and type of proposals a union can make and an agency can be required to bargain, as the proposals are not limited to appropriate arrangements and procedures. But most proposals impact the exercise of Section 7106A management rights and thus need to address the procedures such as the timing or attempt to decrease the impact on the affected employees. These B2 and B3 proposals are negotiable only so long as they do not excessively interfere with management's exercise of its Section 7106A rights. And this is the source of unions' most common bargaining mistake. Unions make proposals to stop or that excessively interfere with the exercise of the management right. For example, to not conduct the RIF or to not conduct it for several years. Both of these proposals would excessively interfere with management's ability to exercise its 7106A management right. Neither of these proposals reflect an attempt to bargain the impacts on unit employees. An agency citing to a section 7106A management right as a basis for refusing to bargain appropriate arrangements and procedure proposals may be committing an unfair labor practice. 
and the union submitting proposals that are not appropriate arrangement or procedures proposals may waive its right to bargain if management is exercising a Section 7106A right. Another way of looking at these issues is to note that bargaining over some matters, including B2 and B3 bargaining, and bargaining over matters that the union may substantively negotiate is mandatory. Well, bargaining over matters like B1 proposals is traditionally permissive. And bargaining over many matters is simply prohibited. The topics listed under B1 include the numbers, types, and grades, and technology methods and means. As I've said, these are traditionally permissive, meaning bargaining B1 matters and proposals is at the election of the agency. In the past, often agencies simply elected not to bargain, and as a result, that was the end of B1 analysis and most bargaining related to B2 and B3. I'll leave it to OPM to handle questions about the meaning, the application, and the enforcement of the executive order. But when agencies bargain B1, that expands the types and nature of proposals unions can submit, assuming it is a time when the union has a right to bargain. Further, once parties sign an agreement that includes B1 matters, the authority considers it a fully enforceable contract provision. But until something is agreed upon, the agency traditionally has had the right to withdraw from bargaining over the B1 matter to unelect to bargain. One final issue about bargaining in general we need to discuss before we take a break and before I hand this over to my colleague David Eddy to delve in depth into B1 by providing examples of negotiable B1 proposals. We need to discuss the covered by defense. Even when it appears to be a time when there is a duty to bargain, such as related to a change. If the parties have a current collective bargaining agreement, like a term agreement or a memorandum of understanding covering the issue, that agreement may present a defense to the duty to bargain. Said another way, an agency can assert, we don't have to bargain about reductions in force because we have already bargained that in our current contract. That means the parties have the right to rely on valid contracts, to take actions based on and authorized by those contracts, and to not have to rebargain matters covered by existing contracts. Of course, it is also true that the parties may mutually agree to renegotiate existing contracts and agreements. This may occur any time both sides mutually agree to reopen the contract or agreement for bargaining. But should either side prefer to retain the existing agreement and refuse to bargain otherwise? Authority case law allows that until the agreement's term expires. Disputes over whether the covered by defense is valid and eliminates the duty to bargain can be resolved in the arbitration or unfair labor practice processes. But authority case law makes it clear, once a matter is bargained to agreement, so long as the agreement is in place, there may be no continuing duty to bargain, even over B1 proposals when the more general topic or matter is included in the contract. Thank you for your time today. This overview included many terms, concepts, general rules, and exceptions to those rules. If these terms and ideas are new to you, as with any learning effort, it will take time to understand their nuance and application. I hope the program will help you in your efforts to understand the statute and the rights and duties it creates. I also hope it helps you in your internal strategy discussions, as well as in your conversations with your counterparts on the other side of the bargaining table. Let's take a 10 minute break. And when we return, my colleague, David Eddy, will examine Authority B1 precedent. David has worked for years as chief counsel to several members and currently is serving as a special counsel to FLRA chairman Ernie Dubester. So I will hand this over to David who will start after the break.
Hello, I'm David Eddy, special counsel to Chairman Ernie Dubester at the Federal Labor Relations Authority. In this segment, I'm going to discuss what types of matters fall within the scope of Section 7106B1 of the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, or the statute, which is set out at 5 U.S.C. Section 7106B1. In other words, I'm going to generally answer the question, if you're going to bargain over Section 7106B1 matters, what sorts of things are you going to be negotiating? As I go through these slides, you'll see citations to FLRA decisions that can give you more details about the individual cases. You can find those cases on the FLRA's website, flra.gov. One quick disclaimer at the outset though, although I'm going to discuss what the authority previously has held, I cannot and do not predict what the authority may hold in any particular case in the future. With that disclaimer, let's talk about what the authority previously has held regarding Section 7106B1 of the statute. Considered very broadly, Section 7106B1 of the statute encompasses two categories of matters, the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to any organizational subdivision, work project, or tour of duty, and the technology, methods, and means of performing work. I say very broadly because both of these categories have numerous parts, which I will discuss in greater detail. The first category, numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to any organizational subdivision, work project, or tour of duty, can basically be thought of as involving the establishment of agency staffing patterns or the allocation of staff for the purposes of an agency's organization and the accomplishment of its work. The first term in this category, numbers, is broad. So a bargaining proposal will concern the number of employees or positions if that proposal seeks to increase, decrease, or even maintain the existing number of employees that the agency has assigned or is proposing to assign. Turning to the next term in this category, the authority defines types of employees or positions as distinguishable classes, kinds, groups, or categories of employees or positions that are relevant to the establishment of staffing patterns. Again, a pretty broad term. Some examples of things that the authority has found to be types of employees or positions include temporary employees, employees with term appointments, and dental hygienists. The third term in the category of numbers, types, and grades is, you guessed it, grades. For example, what are the general schedule levels of the positions that will be staffing a particular organizational subdivision, work project, or tour of duty? One important caveat here, though, proposals that would establish the classification of a position do not fall within this category. More on that distinction later. So we've talked generally about the terms numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions, but to fall within the scope of 7106B1, a bargaining proposal must involve the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to particular things, specifically organizational subdivisions, work projects, or tours of duty. But what do those terms mean? Essentially, I like to think of an agency's organizational subdivision as how the agency organizes itself either structurally, its components like an org chart, or geographically. Some examples of bargaining proposals or contract provisions that have been found to address organizational subdivisions have included those that involved centralization or decentralization of staffing within an agency, such as a proposal that management continue to maintain specific positions at specific locations rather than moving them to a central location, and proposals or provisions that would establish how an agency's organizational subdivisions would be staffed. 7106B1 
also covers the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to a work project. The authority has said that a work project is a particular job or task. Some examples of work projects are supervising inmates and dental assistance duties. Additionally, 7106B1 covers the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to a tour of duty. Now, the authority has defined tour of duty in a way that should be pretty familiar to anyone working in the federal government. It's the hours of a day or daily tour and the days of an administrative work week or weekly tour that constitute an employee's regularly scheduled administrative work week. One thing to note here, though, is that tour of duty is different from office hours. For example, a proposal that would establish when, say, a Social Security claims office is open to the public does not involve the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions assigned to a particular tour of duty. Now, just to wrap up the first broad category of matters covered by 7106B1, here are some additional examples of proposals or provisions that have been found to involve the numbers, types, or grades of employees or positions assigned to an organizational subdivision, work project, or tour of duty. A proposal requiring an agency to fill an existing vacant position at an organizational subdivision concerned the number of employees assigned to that subdivision because it would effectively require the agency to increase the number there. And a contract provision requiring an agency to schedule employees to an eight-hour workday with a half-hour, non-paid, duty-free lunch period concerned the number of employees assigned to a tour of duty. Now, by contrast, a proposal that the agency establish a particular subdivision would not by itself be covered by 7106B1 because the establishment of an organizational subdivision is not the same thing as proposing how that subdivision will be staffed. Remember, numbers, types, and grades are all about staffing patterns. One area where there can be a lot of confusion is whether matters concerning the classification of positions involve the numbers, types, and grades of employees or positions under 7106B1. So why is that important? Under the statute, agencies are required to bargain only over conditions of employment of bargaining unit employees. Section 7103A14B of the statute excludes from the definition of conditions of employment policies, practices, and matters relating to the classification of any position. In other words, if a bargaining proposal involves the classification of a position, then the agency is not required to bargain over it, regardless of whether it also involves a matter under 7106B. Some examples of proposals that were found to have involved classification matters have included a proposal requiring an agency to establish a particular classification, and a proposal requiring an agency to reclassify existing positions. Contrast that with proposals that would establish the numbers, positions, and grades in an agency's Philadelphia operations, but would not require the agency to classify or reclassify particular existing positions, or to place incumbent employees into the positions established by the proposals. Those types of proposals have been found not to involve classific classification. Instead, they involve the numbers, types, and grades of employees assigned to an organizational subdivision under 7106B1. Let me just pause here and emphasize that I know that this can be confusing. And while there's no hard and fast rule, I think that a good way to think of the distinction between classification and numbers, types, and grades is to think of classification as looking at particular duties and deciding what grade they should be classified at, while numbers, types, and grades is taking existing, already classified positions and determining how they will be distributed among organizational subdivisions, work projects, or tours of duty. Now, Moving away from numbers, types, and grades, 
let's turn to the second broad category of matters that are covered under 7106B1. Specifically, the technology, methods, and means of performing work. First, technology. The authority has defined technology as the technical method that will be used in accomplishing or furthering the performance of the agency's work. If a party argues that a bargaining proposal involves the technology of performing work, that party must show, first, the technological relationship of the matter addressed by the proposal to accomplishing or furthering performance of the agency's work, or in more plain English, that the matter discussed in the bargaining proposal has some technological relationship to accomplishing or furthering the agency's work. And second, the party must show how the proposal would interfere with the purpose for which the technology was adopted. To illustrate, some examples of proposals or provisions that have been found to involve the technology of performing work have included proposals or provisions that would require an agency to provide employees with a computer terminal to perform their work, or would require that employees have certain types of telephone lines in their offices. Now, one thing to note is that both of those types of proposals or provisions have also been found to involve the means of performing work, which I'll discuss momentarily. Keep in mind that a single proposal or contract provision can involve more than one category or subcategory under Section 7106B1. Turning to the second category covered by technology methods and means, the authority has defined method as the way in which an agency performs its work, or in short, how will the agency accomplish its work? As for the third category, or means of performing work, the authority has defined means as any instrumentality, including an agent, tool, device, measure, plan, or policy that the agency uses to accomplish or further the performance of its work. Quite the list. But in short, means concerns with what will the agency accomplish its work. So regarding the second and third categories, to show that a bargaining proposal concerns either the methods or the means of performing work, a party must show, first, that there is a direct and integral relationship between the agency's chosen methods or means and the accomplishment of the agency's mission, and that the bargaining proposal would directly interfere with the mission-related purpose for which the method or means was adopted. Now, a couple of points about methods and means. First, the relative importance of the agency's chosen method or means is irrelevant. A bargaining proposal can concern the agency's methods or means, even if the agency's chosen methods or means seem relatively insignificant in terms of accomplishing the agency's mission. And second, whether a proposal concerns methods or means often turns on what the agency's particular mission is. So, a proposal that may involve methods or means at the IRS, for example, may not involve methods or means at the Department of Defense, different missions. To illustrate, one type of bargaining proposal that has been found to concern the methods and means of performing work are proposals that would allow air reserve technicians to wear civilian clothing rather than military uniforms. In other words, for those employees, the agency's decision to require military uniforms involved the agency's methods and means of performing work. But note, not all matters involving clothing necessarily concern the methods and means of performing work. For example, a proposal that allowed certain uniformed customs officers to wear cargo shorts in certain environments did not concern methods and means where the agency allowed shorts in some environments, but not in others, and the agency failed to explain why allowing shorts in some environments, but not others, related to how the agency's work was done. 
Another example of a proposal involving the methods and means of performing work was a proposal that required an agency to erect partitions at least five feet high between cubicles, where that agency was a news broadcast organization and the agency established that lower partitions facilitated communications in a fast-paced news environment. Further, in some cases, workspace design can constitute the methods and means of performing work. For example, where the Social Security Administration established a link between a particular Social Security Office's floor plan and the efficient performance of the agency's services to the public, the authority found that a proposal for a different floor plan concerned the methods and means of performing work. But in other cases, bargaining proposals involving workspace design have not been found to involve the methods or means of performing work. For example, where an agency failed to demonstrate a direct and integral relationship between seating employees according to their work groups and accomplishing the agency's mission, a bargaining proposal that would allow employees to select offices without regard to work group assignment did not concern the methods or means of performing work. Again, it often depends on the individual agency's particular mission. For example, let's say that an agency has a smoking policy. For most agencies, a proposal to modify the agency's smoking policy wouldn't have any link to the agency's mission, so it probably would not concern the methods or means of performing work under the authority's test. But what if the agency's mission is related to healthcare, such as running a hospital? Then the agency's smoking policy could involve that agency's methods and means of performing work, as the authority found for the Indian Health Service. Because this area of the law can be pretty confusing, let's look at a few additional examples of things that have been found not to involve the methods and means of performing work. Proposals reg regarding how an agency evaluates work that has already been performed, such as the number of tiers in a performance appraisal system, do not concern the methods and means of performing work. Further, if a proposal involves who will perform agency work, such as contractors, it will not involve the methods or means of performing work unless it also has some effect on how the agency will perform its work or the tools it will use to perform work. And similar to a point that I discussed earlier regarding numbers, types, and grades, proposals that establish an organiz organizational subdivision without more, have been found not to involve the methods and means of performing work. Next, I know that Bill Kersner gave a broader overview of bargaining earlier, so I won't go into detail here regarding how the various parts of Section 7106 of the statute work together, but one thing that I know causes a lot of confusion is how Section 7106A of the statute interacts with section 7106B1 of the statute. In general, parties are legally prohibited from bargaining over matters that fall under section 7106A unless an exception to 7106A applies. And section 7106B1 is one such exception, allowing bargaining over the types of matters we're discussing here, numbers, types, and grades, and technology methods and means. So, if an individual bargaining proposal involves both a matter covered under Section 7106A and also covers a matter under 7106B1, then what happens? Are you prohibited from bargaining? The short answer is no, because as I said, 7106B1 is an exception to 7106A. I'll give you several examples, not only to illustrate this particular point, but also just to give you some more examples of what sorts of things are encompassed within 7106B1. One example is discussed at 54 FLRA 1302. 
The proposal there would have required the agency to maintain a specific number of accounting technician positions at specific locations, rather than moving them to a central location. On the one hand, the proposal affected management's right to determine its organization under 7106A, because the right to determine organization includes determining the geographic locations in which an agency will provide services or otherwise conduct its operations. Now, on the other hand, the proposal also concerned the numbers, types, and grades of positions assigned to an organizational subdivision. So, 7106A did not prohibit the parties from bargaining over it. Another case where a proposal concerned both 7106A and 7106B1 matters was 58 FLRA 273. The agency there had a pilot program involving the use of email to respond to certain internet inquiries. As it existed, the pilot program did not apply to the agency's field office component. The union proposed expanding the pilot program to eight field office locations. The authority found that this proposal affected management's right to assign work under 7106A because the proposal would require the agency to assign the work associated with the pilot program to the agency's field office component. The proposal also affected management's right to determine the agency's organization under 7106A because it would have di dictated how the agency distributed the responsibility of conducting the pilot program among its components. At the same time, however, the proposal also concerned the technology of performing work under 7106B1. So again, 7106A did not prohibit bargaining. Further, proposals that would have required an agency to schedule employees to a tour of duty without an unpaid lunch period affected management's right to assign work because they would have restricted the agency's ability to change employees' hours of work. But because they also established a tour of duty, they fell within 7106B1 and the parties were not prohibited from bargaining. Another proposal that involved both 7106A and 7106B1 matters was involved in 57 FLRA 373. There, the proposal would have maintained two security officers on each shift. The authority found that the proposal affected management's right to determine the agency's internal security practices because the agency's allocation of staff was directly related to security concerns. However, the proposal also concerned the number of employees assigned to a tour of duty under 7106B1. So bargaining was not prohibited. Proposals requiring an agency to retain a certain number of licensed practical nurse positions at their current locations until the positions are vacated through attrition, retirement, or other means affected management's right to assign work under 7106A. But they also concerned the numbers and types of employees or positions assigned to an organizational subdivision under 7106B1. Again, bargaining was not prohibited. Further, a proposal requiring an agency to maintain at its St. Louis division certain staffing levels affected management's rights to hire and assign employees under 7106A, but it also concerned the number of employees assigned to an organizational subdivision under 7106B1, so bargaining was not prohibited. A proposal that would have required an agency to provide an intelligence officer with a secure phone line affected management's right to determine the agency's internal security practices under 7106A, but it also concerned technology and means of performing work, so bargaining again was not prohibited. And last example, I promise, a bargaining proposal that would have prohibited the National Archives from implementing a uniform requirement for research room employees 
affected management's right to determine the agency's internal security practices because the National Archives had determined that requiring those employees to wear blazers would deter those who might consider engaging in illegal conduct. At the same time, the proposal also concerned the methods and means of performing work under 7106B1. Again, for all of the proposals discussed in these examples, they were not prohibited subjects of bargaining just because they affected management rights under 7106A. That's because, again, 7106B1 is an exception to 7106A. Finally, just a few additional points about 7106B1. Putting aside the executive order for a minute, the statute itself makes 7106B1 proposals permissive subjects of bargaining. But as we've just discussed at length with regard to 7106A and 7106B1, an individual bargaining proposal can concern more than one type of matter covered under 7106. And the statute also makes matters that fall under 7106B2 and 7106B3, or procedures and appropriate arrangements, mandatory subjects of bargaining. So, if a proposal involves not only a 7106B1 matter, normally permissive under the statute, but also a 7106B2 or B3 matter, the statute itself requires bargaining. Another important point is that if a proposal is contrary to laws other than 7106, the fact that the proposal may also involve a 7106B1 topic doesn't matter. The proposal is still unlawful and bargaining is prohibited. And finally, if parties at the bargaining table reach agreement on a 7106B1 matter, the agency head cannot disapprove that agreement unless it is otherwise unlawful. And that's it for my segment of the presentation. Now we'll turn over to Michael Wolf, the director of the FLRA's Collaboration and Alternative Dispute Resolution Office, who will discuss best practices and advice for successful bargaining. Thank you for listening.
Welcome back from break, and thank you for the introduction, David. My name is Michael Wolf. As David said, my primary role at the FLRA is serving as the director of the Collaboration and ADR Office, which we call CADRO. CADRO helps agencies and unions achieve negotiated solutions to complex and sensitive cases pending before the authority and the FLRA administrative law judges including negotiability petitions and unfair labor practice complaints. We also help agencies and unions prevent destructive conflict, manage constructive conflict, and improve the health of labor management relationships. I hope you've absorbed a great deal of material delivered by the FLRA Chairman Special Counsel David Eddy, FLRA Regional Attorney Bill Kirstner, and OPM's Deputy Associate uh, uh, Director for Accountability and Workforce Relations, Tim Curry. If a written transcript of this training program is not yet available, it will be shortly. For those of you attending the live stream broadcast of this training on October 28, 2021, please join the four of us immediately after this segment. I'll give you a short break there too. Uh, when we're going to be doing a live Q&A session. Before the Q&A session begins, um, I encourage you to use the chat function in WebEx to post questions for all four presenters. If you're viewing this uh, from our YouTube channel and your uh, questions are ones that you would like to send us by email, uh, use the email address EO training questions, EO training questions at FLRA.gov. A recording of this entire training, including the QA session and an FAQ, will be added to our YouTube channel shortly. I started preparing for today by reviewing almost 40 years of presentation files that I developed or adapted throughout my labor management career. When someone has taught aspects of collective bargaining for that long, you would think that they could just repurpose some existing presentation for a program like today. Maybe I could have done that, but then I thought, what if you were sitting here next to me and you asked me, how can I most successfully bargain B1 matters today? Now, especially in light of Executive Order 14003, I decided that this topic really deserves a fresh look. So how can you be most successful bargaining B1 matters today? The question here is not just how to bargain B1 matters, but how to be most successful. I can answer that question without offering legal advice and without suggesting how to be successful at the expense of others. But please keep in mind that there's no single correct answer to this question. In fact, during this presentation, I'd like you to please use the chat function in WebEx or the email address I just gave you for YouTube, same one that, uh, that Bill Kirstner gave you earlier, eotrainingquestions at flra.gov, no spaces in there. I'd like to encourage you to share your ideas about what should be on the list of the most important things negotiators can do to be successful when bargaining B1 matters today. Let's see if your ideas and my ideas overlap. I have an easier time interpreting and understanding someone if I have some context for what they say. I'd like to offer you a little context for what you hear from me. Before joining the FLRA staff in 2010, I spent about five years on the ADR staff of the National Mediation Board. And before that, about 10 years at the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, where I helped employers and unions achieve negotiated solutions to uh, disputes in collective bargaining agreements, grievances, and other labor management matters. For more than a decade before that, I was a party advocate, an attorney in federal sector workplace matters. Um, and in that role, I negotiated collective bargaining agreements and litigated if I was 
unable to negotiate resolution for labor management disputes. I've also taught labor management relations, alternative dispute resolution, and negotiations to graduate students, law students, and workplace practitioners. Well, there are two common threads that seem to run through this career. First, managing conflict through negotiation. And second, teaching party representatives how to resolve disputes without unnecessarily abdicating control to a third party. During the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to try to apply what I've learned uh, to the subject of B1 bargaining. I like to consider ideas in groups of three. As you might imagine, there are more than three things that we must do to be most successful bargaining B1 matters. So in the spirit of threes, I'm going to offer three groups of three containing the most important things that you can do to be most successful bargaining B1 matters. Now look at the nine items on this screen. Uh, from where I'm sitting, maybe, oh, no, probably over there. Is each one of these necessary to be most successful bargaining B1 matters? I think the answer is yes. Are there any of these that are unrealistic or overly difficult for most people? I think the answer is no. You can do this. Nevertheless, some of you might still wonder, do we really need to do all this? And my answer really is a question for you. How important is it for you to be successful bargaining B1 matters? The more that success matters to you, the more important it will be for you to engage in a way that gives you the best chance of success. If you plan to bargain over things that don't matter very much, then mediocre might be good enough. But parties rarely bargain over things that don't matter. The outcome of bargaining over B1 subjects is most likely important to you, to your staff, to your bargaining unit members, to your agencies, and to the American public. So only the best outcomes should be good enough. Work with your teams to decide the meaning of success and what it takes to be successful in these negotiations. Spend the time necessary to prepare for success and to engage in the actions necessary to achieve success. Now, looking back at the screen next to me, to be most successful, bargaining B1 matters. Demonstrate mutual respect. Listen actively. Solve problems rather than just resolve disputes. Jointly adopt an appropriate bargaining model. Learn both before and after bargaining. Adopt a process agreement instead of ground rules. Brief all negotiators on current bargaining policy and law. At the bargaining table, focus on what both parties care about most rather than just focusing on language. And finally, engage your stakeholders early and often. When I summarize in that way, it might sound relatively easy. Experienced negotiators know that it's not. And the unique dynamics of bargaining B1 matters makes it even more challenging. But as I said before, you can do this. Let's see what each of these headings means. There's no special order for critical elements of successful B1 bargaining, but the one that always comes to the top of my list is mutual respect. Mutual respect means at least several things. First, consistently demonstrate respect for each other, regardless of grade, position, rank, or any other characteristic. This includes respecting each other's roles in the collective bargaining process. As negotiators in collective bargaining, you are representatives. You are advocates. Negotiators in collective bargaining are expected to achieve meaningful outcomes 
for the institutions and the stakeholders whom you represent. Whether you care about the same things as other negotiators, and whether you agree with their goals or how they try to achieve them, demonstrating respect for others' roles in collective bargaining is part of demonstrating respect for the institutions and the people whom other negotiators represent. You have a right to expect respect as a collective bargaining negotiator, and you have a corresponding obligation to demonstrate respect for other negotiators. Second, consistently demonstrate respect for others' legitimate interests. Interests are the reasons that each of you care about the issues that you're negotiating. If you respectfully ask why the content of their proposal or the content of their idea is important, you will begin to understand what they really care about. It might have nothing to do with the language of their proposal. To demonstrate respect, ask in ways that show you're inquisitive rather than sounding like you're challenging their beliefs. Their answer might cause you to still wonder why the content of their proposal is one is important. Find ways to respectfully ask the question why, and try to even do it without using the word why. And do it until you really understand what is important about the content and the purpose of their proposal. Now, we don't determine whether they care about something that's legitimate or whether they care about something important. That's their prerogative to determine what's legitimate and what's important. We can determine how to demonstrate respect for those interests that they have and to thereby acknowledge their interests. We have no obligation to agree, much less adopt their interests, but we create unnecessary obstacles by failing to respect their interests. Third, consistently demonstrate respect for others' ideas. Now, that doesn't mean we need to agree with their ideas any more than we need to adopt their interests. We demonstrate respect for others' ideas by actively showing them that we are listening. I'll speak more about listening in just a moment. We demonstrate respect for others' ideas by exploring their ideas and asking questions to discover how the idea might work by building on their idea rather than trying to replace it with your own. We also demonstrate respect for others' ideas by what we don't do. We don't interrupt them before they finish speaking. We don't laugh at their ideas. We don't immediately say, oh, we've tried that. It didn't work. We don't sigh, look up at the ceiling, shake our heads. Without mutual respect for each other, respect for others' legitimate interests, and respect for their ideas, everything else becomes far more difficult. The most important communication skill is not what I'm doing now. The most important communication skill is listening. There are all sorts of barriers to listening, some of which appear on screen right now. Um, am I pointing in the right direction here? There are all sorts of barriers. Um, now, one that isn't listed is the challenge of engaging each other on screen in two dimensions. What body part do you use when you listen? How many of you thought, my ears? Well, ears are what we use to hear, but our brain is what we use to listen. A big part of why I never seem to run out of work managing workplace conflict is that even when people hear each other, many don't seem to listen. And even when negotiators listen, they seem to think listening is a passive event. They're not actively listening. How do you react after you say something really important, but whomever you're speaking with 
that person doesn't seem to do anything to show that they're listening. This can be a serious barrier to communication and it can make it more difficult to reach agreement on anything. Now, active listening is an interactive process. That's why we call it active listening. When we actively listen, we use our brains, plus we use our hands, our eyes, our facial expressions, our body language. We ask appropriate open-ended versus closed-ended questions. We use techniques like reflective listening and paraphrasing, restatement and summarizing to accomplish specific tasks without sounding like we're using techniques. When my son was little, he sometimes would say, Dad, you're doing it to me again. I hope I've gotten better since then. And that brings up an important point. None of us was born with the ability to actively listen. Like any other skill, active listening requires training and practice. When was the last time you received training and active listening skills and consciously practiced those skills? If it's been a while, that could be a barrier to successful B1 bargaining. By the way, please do not discount the importance of other communication skills just because I am focusing on active listening at the moment. I often remind myself that if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. So I limited myself to three groups of three priorities today, and active listening pops to the top. To get the attention of the Federal Labor Relations Authority, most labor management disputes must be framed as a legal question that can be resolved by a decision from an administrative law judge, the authority, or the Federal Service Impasses Panel. Typically, when a case is decided, one party loses. Sometimes, but not always, the other party wins. Until the case is over, the parties might not realize what they won or lost. Um, and they might not realize that it could be just the answer to a legal question, which is not always the same as solving the problem that gave rise to the legal question. When you bargain a B1 matter, ask yourself what it means to be successful at the bargaining table um, and at the end of that bargaining process. Does success simply mean that you can check the box saying, we completed bargaining? Or does it mean that you took the first step towards possibly seeking a third party decision in a legal dispute? Or does success mean that you work towards resolving the underlying concerns that prompted bargaining over the B1 matter? Your answer to that question of what it means to be successful at the end of B1 bargaining is an important fork in the road, and thus the image on this slide. I suggest that you make that choice consciously and jointly with the other party at the bargaining table. Yes, make it together. If you want to solve problems that gave rise to B1 bargaining, and if they want to engage in dispute resolution over legal questions, your potential labor management conflict will be about more than just the substance of the B1 matter. Give serious consideration to adopting a problem-solving approach. Especially when bargaining B1 matters, this can be something that um, minimizes risk. And for example, the risk that questions of policy or law might become an insurmountable barrier to bargaining you'll be better able to focus on questions like, what's your real concern? And what problem are we really trying to resolve? Rather than be stuck on the question of, is this proposal language mandatory or permissive or something along that line? I also think that you'll be more likely to reach meaningful agreements about matters that affect numbers, types, and grades, or the methods and means of performing work. You'll be able to do that if you focus on problem solving rather than dispute resolution. 
So I've talked about demonstrating mutual respect, listening actively, and solving problems rather than just resolving disputes. That completes the first group of three. Now, let's take a look at the second trio. I'm going to use the terms bargain and negotiate interchangeably. The most effective negotiators interact with each other for the purpose of achieving a valuable outcome about something that matters. Let me say that one more time. The most effective negotiators interact with each other for the purpose of achieving a valuable outcome about things that matter. Notice that I didn't say that the most effective negotiators settle things or reach agreements. A negotiated agreement is not always better than not reaching an agreement. Unless a negotiated agreement contains a valuable outcome about things that matter to your stakeholders, your stakeholders might wonder, why did you just spend time and resources to produce an agreement that doesn't matter? When you bargain B1 matters, seek valuable outcomes about things that matter. Your determination about how to do that requires several choices. For most of you, the most fundamental choice is between distributed versus integrative models of bargaining. In many, if not most cases, the long-term impact of choosing a labor management relationship based on a distributive or integrative bargaining model is more important than almost any single topic that you bargain. In distributive bargaining, negotiators divide what's at stake based on relative power. It's a zero-sum game with a relatively fixed pie, and it involves a natural tension between elements of cooperation and competition. A purely distributive bargaining model can be most effective in transactional matters where there's no ongoing relationship between the disputants. Think rear-end car accident involving people who don't know each other and never will, or a failed eBay sale, or a birthday gift that you bought online that didn't arrive on time. In distributive bargaining, success is not only measured by what I gain, it's also measured by what you lose. You probably guessed that word before I said it. That's why distributive bargaining is called a zero-sum game. In order for me to win as much as I can, usually you must lose. And part of my job as a negotiator might be to use my power to cause you to lose so that I can win more. To be successful in distributive bargaining, I need to demonstrate forgiveness if you start to cooperate with me, but I'm going to retaliate if you become competitive at my expense. Success in distributive bargaining requires that both parties be clear, consistent, predictable, and flexible, yet firm. What a tightrope to walk. And usually there's no safety net. Using a purely distributive bargaining model creates risk. And it's a risk of a lose-lose outcome as both parties seek the winning side of that win-lose outcome. Think about what happens if an inexperienced negotiator moves too little in the beginning, or the impact of what happens if they move too much in the beginning. What message does that send? And what is the other party going to expect? Or what if the negotiator engages in some unexpected display of power, or proposes to split the difference at the wrong time? Inexperienced negotiators seem to love to split the difference, oftentimes at the wrong time, even if there's no realistic chance of that resulting in some agreement. It simply creates confusion and a disastrous outcome. Distributive negotiators see tactics on TV and in movies and read about them in books, and some robo-negotiator might have written some how-to manual that they you know, got it some CLE class. And so the negotiator thinks that they can succeed by doing things like making extreme opening offers or intimidating others at the table 
were issuing threats and ultimatums, kicking and yelling and stomping. And I've even seen a negotiator literally jump on the table and scream at the other party from the middle of the table. Um, you know, some robo negotiators use stalling tactics, they withhold concessions, they withhold information, they provide misinformation. Now, these kind of tactics, they make for good television, good ratings, maybe, um, good sales of, of books, but they really don't have much legitimate place in collective bargaining regarding or regardless of whatever model you adopt uh, of bargaining. I started mediating labor disputes full time almost 30 years ago. Before then, I spent almost two decades mediating commercial, family and divorce matters. Um, I found that many divorcing couples thought that they were negotiating the end of a relationship. So they used distributive bargaining methods and all sorts of robo tactics that resulted in painful win-lose and oftentimes lose-lose outcomes. Often the winner was defined by who didn't lose as much as the other one. Usually they both lost a tremendous amount. The real loser, though, frequently turned out to be the children, especially after the parents realized that because of the children, they really weren't negotiating the end of their relationship. They were negotiating simply a change in their relationship. They had to live with potentially lifelong consequences of adopting the wrong bargaining model that created more losers than winners. Part of what I hope to do today is help you avoid choosing the wrong bargaining model. Most labor management relationships are best served by an integrative bargaining model or a hybrid that includes elements of distributive and integrative models. That's especially the case for B1 bargaining. In integrative bargaining, negotiators usually begin by agreeing on a problem they want to solve, as opposed to distributive negotiators who agree on a position they try to achieve at the other's expense. Integrative negotiators identify what their stakeholders care about most. We often call those interests. Now, unlike distributive negotiators, integrative negotiators achieve success by using option generation tools like brainstorming, and they use uh, decision-making tools like consensus. Negotiators then constructively use power plus problem-solving techniques to maximize what everyone at the table can le legitimately gain while minimizing everyone's important losses. Integrative negotiators measure success by the extent to which they satisfy as many legitimate interests as possible, and the extent to which they minimize everyone's lost opportunity. They don't do this just to be nice. They do it because it makes good business sense for everyone involved. Now, this doesn't mean that anyone always gets everything they want. That's not real. And it's not realistic in any method of bargaining. But Integrative negotiators are more likely to get more value out of bargaining matters during the life of their ongoing labor management relationship than distributive negotiators. Integrative negotiators learn techniques rather than tactics. Far more than just good intentions, these are specific skills that enable the negotiators to cooperate, to constructively engage each other, to change the rules, to take responsible risks, to use their power to attack problems rather than each other, to expand upon, to share information, achieve creative solutions, and work together for mutual success. So in summary, distributive bargaining models are designed to resolve disputes over transactional matters between parties who are 
usually unconcerned about managing an ongoing relationship. Integrative bargaining models are designed to solve problems between parties whose best interest is served by effectively managing their ongoing relationship. You can decide which one is right for your B1 bargaining. That choice, though, is another fork in the road. It will determine most other choices that you make as a negotiator, and it can have a dramatic impact on your labor and management relationship and broader workplace relations long after you complete bargaining. Once again, choose your fork carefully. Success in either model requires predictability and therefore consistency in your bargaining relationship. So your choice is likely to remain your fork for quite some time. You can switch between distributive and integrative bargaining models, but expect that it's going to require time and resources and mistakes will be made and bruises will occur and need to heal. There'll need to be new skill building. There'll need to be a joint understanding by labor and management as to what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve and probably some external trainer and a guide to help you make a successful transition. Earlier, I commented that none of us was born knowing how to actively listen. The only people who excel at active listening are those who train and practice. The same goes for bargaining. Regardless of the models that you adopt, um, training and practice are key. In fact, the best negotiators bring world-class bargaining skills to the negotiation arena, whether they're called upon one day to use distributive or another day to use integrative methods or a combination of both. Many of us choose paths in life where we acquire knowledge and skills that help us as negotiators. But unless you were born in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, that's unlikely to be enough to be consistently uh, successful and to consistently achieve the best outcomes, especially when your bargain B1 matters. I'm, I've tried to find a nice way to say that you should expect to use mediocre bargaining methods and achieve mediocre outcomes in B1 unless you attend some good training that's specific to your chosen bargaining model and then practice and get some good experience. You and members of your team probably can learn distributive bargaining skills individually and independent of the other party. But best practice for integrative bargaining is that teams that intend to bargain with each other should train together. Yes, labor and management bargaining teams should jointly participate in this training. In fact, some of the best trainers that I know, they won't, normally they won't train one party unless they jointly train both parties. The best and most time efficient integrative bargaining training is designed and delivered specifically for your bargaining teams and bargaining situation. The Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service has delivered such training for decades and has some very skilled mediators who are excellent trainers and they have federal sector experience. Some of them do. I don't believe that they charge for the training, but you'll need to check with them. My office at the FLRA also delivers collective bargaining training, also at no cost when our staffing resources permit it. Of course, there are private trainers as well, um, and you can probably uh, get referrals from, from those whom you trust. I want to mention another important aspect of learning besides all the front end learning that I'm talking about so far. Uh, and that's learning that you do after you finish bargaining a B1 matter. Consider jointly conducting a post-mortem each time that, that you do B1 bargaining and ask, what did we learn from this? Now, two specific aspects of B1 bargaining deserve, I think, specific attention when you finish bargaining. First, 
measure the bargaining process, document what went well and what didn't go so well, and then ask, and I, again, I suggest doing this as a labor management initiative, not independently, ask, what should we continue doing the next time unchanged? Second question, what should we modify? Third question, what should we start doing that we didn't do this time? And fourth question, what should we stop doing the next time? The next thing that I suggest that you learn from after you complete B1 bargaining is by measuring outcome. How did the B1 bargaining impact mission achievement? What about quality of work life? How did it affect your labor management relationship and overall workplace climate? It probably will take longer to learn from this second set of questions, but it's vitally important. Collectively, what we all learn from gathering such data might even influence future public policy determinations. Your success negotiating B1 matters will be, at least in part, determined by how you handle ground rules. As radical as it might sound, consider adopting only one ground rule. We will at all times demonstrate mutual respect, period. Two, four, six, eight words. That may be all the ground rules you need. And if you follow that one ground rule, you really might not need any others. If you fail to follow that ground rule, other ground rules might not matter. And if you had them, they might not save you. Most ground rules are like handcuffs. Instead of adopting a page or more of handcuffs, I suggest that before you start bargaining that you develop a process agreement. The primary difference between ground rules and a process agreement is that ground rules are designed to keep the other party from doing bad things to you. Whereas a process agreement enables both parties to do things better together. Depending upon the scope of intended B1 bargaining, some process agreements I've seen are one page long, while others are many pages, many pages long. Think of what the principles and procedures are that you might need to enable both parties to be successful in B1 bargaining. Integrative bargaining training probably is gonna help you identify essential elements for your process agreement. For example, you might start with principles and principles that guide you in this bargaining process, such as we will attack problems, not each other. We will keep asking why to find out interests, of course, and do so respectfully. We will work hard to develop creative options that satisfy as many interests as possible. We will use power constructively with each other, not destructively against each other. And unless we're really ready to say yes, we will explore ways to say yes, but instead of no. So in addition to principles, your process agreement can contain commitments, like commitments to reconsider the meaning of success and to help each other be successful, to treat differences as strengths and value the diversity of everyone involved and diversity in all of its forms, to share appropriate information, to educate your constituents and rather than solicit their positions, Listen to why they care about the topic that you're bargaining. Your process agreement can contain acknowledgement that success requires both parties to be prepared and an agreement to enter each negotiation session fully prepared. Many process agreements also contain parties agreements to use an outside facilitator when it's appropriate to help manage process so you can better focus on substance. Many process agreements adopt consensus as the party's model of decision-making. That's a huge deal and sometimes makes a difference between whether you jointly win or jointly lose in this bargaining process. 
So this includes parties' willingness to consider and adopt solutions that they can support even when they prefer something else. And that's part of why parties adopt consensus as a, a bargaining decision-making model and integrative bargaining processes. So before we jump forward, let me ask, why would you support a negotiated solution if you really preferred something else? Process agreements can remind negotiators that this is possible when the negotiators first seek to fully understand each other's points of view. And then they share adequate information rather than using it as a tool. They engage each other openly and fairly, and then they use constructs like BATNA and WATNA to determine whether the negotiated option that's on the table is the best option for both parties at this time. Now, BATNA is a negotiator's best alternative to a negotiated agreement. What's likely to be the best outcome a BATNA is what's likely to be the best outcome if the negotiator says no deal and walks away. And WATNA is a negotiator's worst alternative to the negotiated agreement. What could be the worst outcome if the negotiator says no deal and walks away? When skilled integrative negotiators recognize that the negotiated option on the table is likely to be better than their BATNA, and less risky than their WATNA, then they can decide to support the negotiated option even if they don't prefer it. And consensus tools allow them to get to that, uh, that mutually successful point rather than engaging in mutual failure. Process agreements can reflect negotiators' intention to jointly attend integrative bargaining training to be consistent, predictable, and transparent, and to demonstrate commitment, vision, and courage. Do you think it's a bit corny for me to put into a written agreement that the negotiators will demonstrate commitment, courage, and vision, or even to include that in this training segment? Well, I don't think it's too corny. There is so much that can come between you and success when your bargaining B1 matters. Your commitment to work together for mutual success matters. Actions that demonstrate a joint vision of what you can do together, it matters. Courage is your persistence doing the right thing despite naysayers. It's your effort to keep fear of failure at bay. And it's about not getting discouraged when times are tough. The most successful negotiators are courageous. And there's nothing corny about expressing that commitment in your process agreement. Now this agreement can be reusable. So investing a little time at the front and adjusting it, the agreement over time, that can really be worthwhile. So the second group of three I've just talked about, jointly adopt an appropriate bargaining model, learn both before and after bargaining, and adopt a process agreement instead of ground rules. That's completion of the second group of three. I'd like to now take a look at the third and final group of three. If you've attended this training from the beginning, you heard Tim Curry share the administration's perspective about Executive Order 14003 and B1 bargaining. You, hear, you heard Bill Kersner discuss federal sector collective bargaining, and you heard David Eddy use some important cases to help you better understand how the authority treats bargaining over numbers, types, and grades, and the technology methods and means of performing work. Consider delivering at least a short briefing on current bargaining policy and law for all bargaining team members before negotiating B1 matters. A joint briefing can increase the chances that union and management negotiators enter bargaining with a similar understanding of 
what they can do and what they should avoid doing in connection with B1 bargaining. Mediation is a form of assisted negotiation. In a typical year, agencies and unions negotiate their own resolution to more than 90% of the negotiability disputes mediated by my office. The primary reason for their success is that we help them refocus on the important things that they are trying to achieve, their interests, rather than the specific words of disputed language. The parties often find ways to adopt alternate language that hits the bullseye while avoiding negotiability concerns. They solve the negotiability problem themselves rather than ask a third party to resolve their legal dispute. You can focus on what you and the other party care about most rather than get sidetracked because of specific words in a B1 bargaining proposal but only if you adopt a similar problem-solving approach and an integrative bargaining model. It's also important, of course, then to maintain a steady focus on what you're trying to accomplish. And once you agree on a solution, or at least a path towards that solution, then consider jointly drafting and adopting mutually agreeable language. The real point here is to consider shifting your focus from the specific B1 bargaining language to the underlying matter that you both care about. Your stakeholders might be unfamiliar with approaches identified in this section of the B1 training program. They might not authorize you to engage in a manner consistent with the best practices in this presentation unless they're educated about this bargaining process. If they don't already know, who will teach them if not you? You cannot afford to ignore this element. Negotiators who fail to educate their stakeholders sometimes enter negotiations without sufficient bargaining authority. Other times, uneducated stakeholders give the negotiator drop dead positions because the stakeholders don't understand what's required for successful integrative bargaining. Negotiators can bargain a great agreement, but, if, but stakeholders might fail to support the solution because they're un, inadequately educated about process. In some cases, I've seen stakeholders prevent negotiators from reaching agreements by placing excessive limitations on bargaining options, on policy, on what could be negotiated. I've also seen negotiators lose their positions in management and unions because they neglected to adequately educate and bring along their stakeholders. Even if you do everything else right, please remember to educate your stakeholders early and often. I promised you three groups of three critical elements for successful B1 bargaining, and this completes the third group. To be most successful bargaining B1 matters, demonstrate mutual respect for each other, for their legitimate interests, and for their ideas. Listen actively. Try to solve problems rather than just legal disputes. Jointly adopt an appropriate bargaining model. Engage in learning both before and after bargaining. Adopt a process agreement instead of ground rules. Brief all negotiators on Executive Order 14003 and other current bargaining policy, applicable law, and guidance. At the bargaining table, focus on what both parties care about most, rather than focusing just on language. And finally, engage your stakeholders early and often. Now, if something did not appear in this list, please don't interpret that to mean that it's unimportant. For example, I've not mentioned your overall labor management relationship, but it's a very important element of your success. Allowing for the learning curve is important, and allowing for the unlearning curve may be even more important. Be ready for oh, we're not moving fast enough. You're going to hear it. 
and I've barely mentioned negotiating online from multiple locations. I really hope this segment on successful bargaining for B1 Matters has been useful. Please contact us through the FLRA or OPM websites, FLRA.gov, OPM.gov. If we can do more to help you achieve more successful outcomes in your B1 bargaining. After a short break, please join us for a live Q&A session with FLRA Special Counsel David Eddy, FLRA Regional Attorney Bill Kirstner, OPM Deputy Associate Director for Accountability and Workforce Relations Tim Curry, and me. If you're watching a recorded version of this training program sometime after October 28, 2021, the Q&A session will be recorded and will begin right now because it's being appended to this segment. Thank you very much.
So welcome back. Uh, we're going to get started with our question and answer session live. Uh, we've had a lot of really great questions submitted, so we wanted to thank you all for that. Um, please let me know if somehow I've been having a little trouble just with my video so I can go uh, just as a floating voice. So let me know how it all goes, please. Um, if we could start with Tim Curry from OPM. Tim, there were quite a few questions for you um, involving the enforceability of the executive order. Um, and I can just read a couple of them that were similar for you as, as a way to get you started here. Uh, the first one came in saying, a question I've had from day one is how is this EO enforceable? Given the clear language in the statute and Congress's intent, that legal discretion to bargain on permissive subjects was granted to the agencies. And then the one that's similar, um, but just to tell you it's representative, there were a lot on this. Um, how do we go about enforcing the requirement to bargain over permissive subjects under the EO? Can that be done with a charge or is there some alternative process to enforce the election to bargain if an agency is refusing to bargain over permissive subjects? Okay, uh, th thanks for those questions, Jessica. Uh, I, I can't address whether a charge would be appropriate that that ultimately would uh, rest with the FLRA, although I would note that, you know, generally a ULP charge is a violation of the labor statute, and we're talking about an executive order requirement here. Uh, just, just as a reminder, you know, uh, you know, section four of the executive order did uh, provide the president directed the head of each agency subject to chapter 71 to elect and negotiate over these subjects and instruct subordinate officials to do the same. So OPM did put out guidance, uh, which uh, provided more explanation of the intent by the president in this executive order. And uh, a few things to note, uh, we did note in uh, our March 5th guidance, uh, uh, that a failure by agency managers to engage in bargaining over the subjects covered by 5 U.S.C. 7106B1 would be inconsistent with the president's directive. Uh, therefore, in order to carry out the policy decision of the president reflected in the executive order, agencies must commence bargaining in good faith over all these subjects. And as I noted at the beginning of this training, uh, we, we uh, uh, basically have outlined in this guidance that uh, this would include seeking assistance of FMCS uh, and ultimately going to the Federal Service Impasses Panel. And uh, so what's not spelled out in this guidance, uh, however, is something that we have said uh, in many uh, settings with agencies and with unions that regarding compliance with Executive Order 14003, which has a number of other requirements as well as uh, this uh, this requirement on permissive bargaining or B1 bargaining is OPM will serve as a point of escalation. So if parties are having a disagreement on bargaining obligations under this policy, this uh, policy by the president, uh, they should reach out to OPM. Uh, my office will be the starting point and folks can uh, email uh, awr at opm.gov. That's for accountability and workforce relations. Again, it's awr at opm.gov. And at that point, my team and I will get involved in, in, and begin to take steps uh, to uh, see if we can assist the parties in moving forward. But bottom line is the, the president is the head of the executive branch. He has given a direction to agency officials and, uh, and agency officials are expected to comply with this government-wide policy. And uh, any uh, um, refusal to comply with this policy would be inconsistent with the direction the president has given to agencies. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one will also be for you, Tim, and then I'll try to mix it up a little for the rest of the panel. Sure. Um, the presenter, and this came in during your session, so I know that they meant you, indicated that bargaining uh -huh. over 7106B1 matters shall be substantive. Does that mean that bargaining over permissive topics will no longer be limited to impact and implementation bargaining? Uh, that That is correct. It is no longer limited to impact and implementation bargaining. 
as it was outlined in later uh, descriptions of the B1 topics, you, you got some good practical examples of what it what those methods and means and technology and number types and grades means under the labor statute. Uh, th this is something that now agencies will have to bargain concerning those decisions they're making on that, and it's not limited to impact and implementation. Okay, thank you. All right, now, as I mentioned, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So um, this would be for all of you. Jump in as you feel so inclined, please. Um, the first question that we have is, is B1 bargaining to occur pre-change implementation or post-implementation or both? And if it is both, what would it depend on exactly? Uh, I, I can take first shot. Uh, I, I can tell you from a, a, an OPM perspective, I mean, this issue has actually come up uh, this year uh, to our office, and uh, we do think that there might be a situation where it would be both. Uh, certainly, the, the goal in collective bargaining in general is we would want to do pre-implementation bargaining. Uh, and that, that, that's certainly uh, an expectation under the law. Uh, we have seen situations in the last almost two years where there might be uh, circumstances uh, where post-implementation bargaining is necessary because you're acting in an emergency. And uh, in, in, in those situations, you might have B1 topics that kind of interact with that acting in an emergency uh, and where the agency needs to act quickly. So we do think there's possible scenarios where it could be both. Uh, I'll jump in and say, I think Tim got it right. To me, it's not a question of B1 versus B2 or B3. The question is, when does bargaining routinely occur? The general expectation under the statute is it occurs before changes are implemented. But as Tim noted, when there are exigent circumstances, there certainly is the option for an agency to assert those exigent circumstances require implementation and then post implementation bargaining. And ultimately, if the union wants that issue to be reviewed, it can be reviewed in an unfair labor practice charge to the Office of the General Counsel. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, David Eddy, this one is for you. Um, and it's a question concerning official time. Um, and the question is, did the FLRA change how it approaches official time with regard to its effect on management's rights? That's a good question. Uh, thanks, Jessica. So in, in, just a little bit of background. So the short answer is yes, but a little bit of background is in the past, the authority applied what they called the carve out doctrine, which said that official time under 7131 of the statute was negotiable without regard to 7106 of the statute. So even if an official time proposal would otherwise uh, affect a management right under 7106, it was still negotiable under 7131 of the statute. Um, in actually a decision, the site is 71 FLRA 1247, the authority, um, reversed that rule and said that the carve out doctrine no longer applies. So if you have an official time proposal that affects management rights, the authority will go through its normal management rights analysis and assess whether it affects the management right and whether it falls into some exception to management rights under 7106B. So the short answer is yes. Well, while you're on a roll there and while you get some water, we'll just continue on with you for a moment, David. Um, there was a question that came in that says, I'm concerned about the matters in 7106A that overlap with 7106B, um, such as an organ agency organization. Um, does the authority or OPM have any guidance or training on differentiating between 7106A and 7106B? Um, rights and obligations under the statute. One thing that I would, one reference that I would point people to that there are actually two references that I would point people to that are helpful are 
Uh, the authority has on its website a guide to negotiability under the statute that has a fairly extensive discussion of 7106 and how the different parts of 7106 uh, relate to one another. Um, and there's also some discussion of that in the guide to arbitration as well. I can't remember whether there's much of a discussion of, of that specific topic in sort of the OGC side ones. Bill, would you say that there's guidance that's helpful there? On the OGC side, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I couldn't remember either. But yeah, there's definitely some guidance, and we've given training in the past on management rights. Um, you'll, you, some of the old trainings may still be up on our website, but it's been a little while since we've done it. But um, there are definitely reference materials you can look at that are helpful. Okay, and one that's sort of similar. Um, what is FLRA's role if an agency declares a proposal non negotiable under B1? Are some, but not many, case precedents on the matter involving organizations similar to what was discussed today regarding classification? Okay, um, so the authority's role for that part of the question, the what would typically happen, at least at the authority member level, is if you're at the bargaining table and an agency says that a union proposal is um, permissively negotiable under 7106B1, uh, and let's say the agency refused to bargain over it, um, the union could file a negotiability appeal with the FLRA members directly, and they could decide whether or not, in fact, it involves a, a B1 matter. Um, so that's sort of how I see the authority's role, at least in that context. Um, the part of the question about organization versus classification, I see them as sort of different, different issues. So classification matters are by de by statutory exclusion, not conditions of employment to begin with. So there, as Bill talked about earlier. Agencies only have to bargain over conditions of employment of bargaining unit employees. And so if a classification matter is not a condition of employment of bargaining unit employees based on it being excluded from the statute's definition of that term, there's no duty to bargain over classification matters to begin with. When you get into agency organization, um, so the if if a proposal otherwise affects uh, condition of employment of uh, bargaining unit employees, and also that then it would sort of first step, it would be negotiable. But then, if the proposal also concerns the agency's organization, and under 7106A of the statute, the agency has the right to determine the agency organization, then it would be outside the duty to bargain unless it fell, the proposal fell within an exception to management's right to determine organization. So I think the analysis for whether a B1 proposal involves classification versus whether it involves management's right to determine agency organization is a different analysis. I could end up in the same place that either they're both, you know, they're both non-negotiable, but um, the way you analyze it would be different. The, uh, water. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, the, the OGC is on fairly firm ground on a B2 or a B3 proposal. If it's substantially similar or identical to a proposal, the authority previously found negotiable to say an agency's failure to bargain that represents bad faith bargaining. Um, the challenge is if it's a B1 proposal and everyone is acknowledging it's a B1 proposal, we don't have that firm ground to stand on. Um, Parties have six months to file an unfair labor practice charge from the date of the alleged unfair labor practice. A follow on to Tim Curry's point about his office being the point of escalation for these matters. It seems that that might be a good place to go to first for some of that six months to see if OPM can help. Get the parties bargaining on that proposal and in effect. Um, then avoid the, the refusal to bargain allegation. If not, a party would always be free to file an unfair labor practice charge, and then we would have to assess whether it is or isn't an unfair labor practice. And, and, and if, if I might add from an OPM, from a policy perspective, 
if, if there's a ULP filed for refusing to bargain on B1 topic, that, that would be viewed as being inconsistent with the direction from the president for the agency to bargain on B1 topic. So I would hope that the parties would reach out to us so we can kind of avoid having to deal with that kind of scenario. All right, well, I'm going to, um, Michael Wolf has quite a few questions, so I'm going to turn it over to him. You guys rest up. I'll be back to you shortly. Um, Michael, if you're there, I had a couple questions for you. Um, one of the first questions that came in was, um, if you were able to provide an example for uh, the participants watching today and later, of an agency and a union that really engaged in successful B1 bargaining. Yes, uh, and Jessica, I'm here. So, uh, yeah, I can provide an example. Um, I'll just refer to the parties as agency and union, um, since um, I would otherwise want to ask their permission before further identifying them. But uh, in this example uh, that I'm thinking of, the agency wanted to dramatically change the nature of a nationwide group of bargaining unit employees uh, or their positions. And the change in that case um, affected qualification criteria and selection criteria to fill vacancies. It affected grade structures, performance standards, even affected um, certification requirements for incumbents to be able to retain their current positions. So it was a fairly dramatic uh, change they, an, they anticipated. Um, to make things even more interesting, there were different national unions that represented bargaining of employees at various locations around the country um, that this would all affect. Uh, the unions wanted to bargain over procedures and appropriate arrangements, of course, about the way that management chose to exercise its 7106A rights, but the unions also had a very strong concern about aspects of the change that implicated numbers, types, and grades of the bargaining employees and the methods and means by which those employees would accomplish their work after this change. So the unions and the agency in, in this particular case did something that they had never done before. They formed a, a national bargaining process where um, each, each party, um, the agency and the multiple unions um, established bargaining teams to jointly, as one bargaining process, bargain over the change. Um, and that included the B1 aspects of the proposed change. I, I trained the parties to use integrative bargaining methods to help them construct uh, a process that might help them be successful. And they adopted a, a process agreement as I discussed in my presentation just a short time ago. And uh, I served as a neutral process advisor and a coach for all the teams as they prepared and engaged in the process. I did not attend any of the bargaining sessions, uh, but from what the parties reported to me, they struggled, as you would expect. It was very complex and difficult uh, and high stakes for all of them, but they also succeeded. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the end result they considered to be a success for all of them. Well, that sort of leads me to a follow up question if I can. Um, there was a question that came in during your um, session that says, how, if at all, can you bargain integratively when the party's interests are inherently in conflict or when the other party is using a distributive model? So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, normally, when I when I hear that expressed, um, when I dig a little bit deeper, I find that what the perception is that raises that kind of question 
um, may be a little bit different than what we then discover is, is really happening. Uh, interests rarely are in conflict. Um, generally, interests are either what we call separate or common. Um, either we have separate interests or we have common interests. The common ones are the ones, of course, that overlap and have similarity. And we find that in a, most collective bargaining negotiations, parties do have a lot of common interests that they don't actually even recognize until going through the beginning of their integrated bargaining process. When it feels like they have interests that are in conflict, most often what's really happening is that the parties are engaging in more of a distributive form of bargaining. Um, they may have been trained in integrative bargaining, but um, sometimes they revert back to a distributive model of bargaining where they're actually putting out positions to each other rather than um, the more integrative bargaining um, process. So what's in conflict normally are their positions, not really their interests. Um, and their positions may be disguised because they're trying their hardest, they're trying their best to do integrative and they're not doing it well. Oftentimes I find that a trained facilitator um, usually can help the parties recognize what's really going on and recognize that they've actually just fallen off the rails here and help them get realigned, get their bargaining process fixed um, and, and back on track. So um, for that part of the question, the short answer is usually it's not their interests in conflict, it's that they've adopted positions and may not know it. Uh, the second part of the question um, I think was, how do you do interest-based or integrative bargaining when the other party is using distributive? You can't, effectively you can't. And so that's why both parties, and this was again in what I had uh, recommended uh, earlier in this presentation, that um, both parties really should be trained together how to do this, how to bargain effectively and successfully, because if one party wants to use a distributive model, um, then that's, that doesn't make it possible to successfully do integrated bargaining. Okay, don't go anywhere. I'll come back to you. <laughs> um, David, I had a few more questions that came up during your um, session. Um, I think you mentioned during your presentation that um, military uniforms were methods and means of performing work. Um, but it was this questioner's understanding that military matters were just off the table, illegal to bargain over things that were, you know, concerning military matters. Can you shed some light on that? That's a good question. It's it's an important clarification. Um, so generally, no, you cannot bargain over military. Well, you cannot bargain over military conditions of employment under the statute. Um, but there are certain employees who serve in a dual status, so they're both sometimes in a civilian capacity and sometimes in a military capacity. And the cases involving methods and means of performing work and uniform uh, proposals are all about proposals that employees are able to wear their uniform or wear something other than their uniforms when they're in their civilian capacity. So th that's sort of the limitation on that case law. Um, the authority is not held that uh, it's a permissive subject of bargaining for you to bargain over whether to wear military uniforms when you're in your military capacity, that would be completely off the table. And another one for you while we got you in the hot seat here. Um, is a union proposal to establish a uh, pre-decisional involvement negotiable under uh, B1? Oh, um, so, I'm not sure that the authority has ever ruled on this. So I, I'm just sort of gonna talk through.
through the general principles that surround it without saying what they would say in any particular case. But as a general matter, let's say it were a proposal to bargain over 7106B1 matters. The authority has said proposals to bargain over 7106B1 matters are B1 matters themselves. They're permissive subjects of bargaining under the statute. Now, if you had a proposal to, bar to engage in pre-decisional involvement over 7106B1 matters, I could see an argument that that would be similar, that the authority could find that to itself be a B1 matter. Um, in terms of a proposal that you'll agree to engage in PDI, pre-decisional involvement more generally, I don't know that that would be a 7106B1 matter per se, um, except to the extent that it was PDI over B1 matters. So. Okay, well, that's similar to another question we had, which was, is a proposal to bargain over B1 issues itself um, a B1 issue? <laughs> um, yes. So <laughs> okay. So, um, so can, I, can I weigh in from a policy perspective? Please. Yes, uh, thank on you, Tim. Actually, both those issues. So as far as, uh, as, as David noted, since bar uh, bargaining on a proposal to do B1 bargaining is a B1 matter, consistent with the direction that the president has given if a union were to submit that kind of proposal then the parties would be expected to sit down and negotiate good faith including seeking fmcs and passes panel assistance uh to, to help resolve that if they don't reach agreement you know clearly the statute does say that the you know uh, like collective bargaining doesn't compel either party to um uh, agree to a proposal or make a concession, but you know, it is the expectation that they do bargain in good faith with the goal of reaching some kind of agreement and seeking that third party assistance if necessary. As far as the PDI in general, I would just kind of remind everybody uh, uh, that's listening to this training that, you know, uh, uh, right now, you know, back on May 18th, OPM did put out some guidance to agencies that I strongly encourage agencies to work with their unions to establish labor management forums and use pre-decisional involvement. Uh, we believe agencies have that authority under the statute today to do that, and, and certainly would encourage agencies to do that. And we are starting to see some examples of that happening in some places. Okay, and I think this will be a question for everybody, we're all dealing with it um, as federal employees. Um, but the question was, is bargaining over post-pandemic return to work a 7106B1 matter? And anyone who wants to jump in on that one. If the uh, risk is, just, oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna say, uh, go ahead, Tim, sorry. Oh, well, I, I'll just say real quick, I, I, I believe it could potentially involve both depending on, you know, the, the policies that agencies will implement and, and the, any uh, new uh, changes that are being made, you could potentially see both, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, it depends on what you're proposing, what you're, uh, you could have, some agencies where a return to physical work has more of a link to the methods and means of performing work under B1 than it does for other agencies. You could have bargaining proposals involving, you know, if remote work and what sort of technology you're going to provide employees if they do engage in remote work or telework and things like that. So there can be a whole range of things that could fall under B1, but there could also be a lot of things that don't. So basically what Tim said. You said it better, David. Bill, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I tend to focus on the proposals themselves. And so many proposals are going to be B2 or B3 procedures, timing, what happens when someone gets sick or someone in someone's families gets sick, how that will be dealt with. Those are clearly B2 or B3 proposals. Um, the question is then what types of proposals could be written that would impact B1 matters and submitted. 
Okay. And so just to follow up on, on um, what you guys had talked about a little bit, and I think specifically David had mentioned about methods and means and how that could uh, differ from agency to agency. How specific does an agency need to be in showing that they have an established method or mean? Well, I think if they're making an argument that something involves methods or means is a general, if they make just a general claim, um, I, what comes to mind are cases where, for example, employees wanted to choose their seating arrangements. And I think one of my slides during my presentation may have cited one of these cases. Um, you know, whether or not that concerns methods or means depends on what the agency argues. So we've had cases where an agency has come in and said, it's helpful for employees to sit next to each other because it builds camaraderie. Well, the authority has said that's not really specific enough because you haven't linked that to your mission, explained why camaraderie is important to actually performing your mission. Whereas, for example, if you had employees, you know, we had an example of, um, Trying to think of a good example. Well, there's one. This was more about um, partitions, but we had a case about that I talked about involving a newsroom where the authority found that um, a union proposal that would have made partitions between cubicles too high um, would have affected methods or means because it was a newsroom and it was fast paced and employees needed to be constantly in communication. So I could see a situation where. In that type of situation, if the agency came in and made that case, we would say, yes, um, that's methods and means. So the authority won't determine whether or not the agency's chosen methods or means is, you know, really going to be extremely helpful in accomplishing its mission or anything like that. But the agency does have to come in with something more than just, you know, this helps our, our mission or something really generic. It's got to have something some link to the mission. Maybe like a VA hospital. <laughs> Good example. All right, Michael. Um, we have this question that sort of goes to overall just. I think the trust process and 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 working together, but the question came in that the parties don't trust each other when bargaining over other things. Um, and so the questioner asked, why should we trust each other when bargaining uh, permissive subjects? Well, thank you for that question, whoever submitted it. Um, labor management relationships are institutional. They're designed to transcend time and changes in personnel. Trust is not institutional. Trust is personal. Trust is earned. Uh, so if I'm a new representative of management or a union, it would really, I think, be a mistake for me to enter into some existing labor management relationship and think that I can inherit the, inherit the trust that others might have had from my predecessor. Unfortunately, the converse is not also true. I can enter an existing labor management relationship and I can inherit the mistrust that they had from my predecessor. And that's not something about unions or employers, that's something about people in general. So trust, I. I like to tell people trust is like a house plant. Don't create trust, you grow it. And like that house plant, trust grows slowly over time, provided that you feed it and you take care of it and you water it. And also, like that house plant, trust is far easier and quicker to damage than it is to grow. Um, if you have house plants like mine, you've probably had that experience. I've got at least one that's still alive. Um, <laughs> thank goodness it's resilient. And like 
labor management relationships. We need to grow resilient relationships that can withstand the ups and downs of trust because they do go up and down. Now, once you've damaged trust, it's far more difficult to regrow it. It's not impossible, just more difficult. Um, now, do you need trust in them, whoever them might be? Do you need trust in them in order to effectively negotiate with them, whether it's distributive bargaining or integrative bargaining or whatever label you put on it? I don't think that you absolutely need a high level of trust in them if you can trust the process and trust the managers of the process, which is oftentimes why parties will enlist somebody to help them jointly craft a process that, that they can trust um, as a at least a temporary substitute for having a high level of trust in each other. And then oftentimes they'll identify somebody who can help manage that process um, so that parties can control and own the substance while whoever they identify as their trusted process manager can manage the process and make it a, a trustworthy process. Um, if you're somebody who shares responsibility for damaging trust in the labor management relationship, or if you inherited a relationship that's dominated by mistrust, consider taking steps to repair that damage. You know, it means affirmatively actually doing something. It takes time, no matter what you do, even if you do all the right things. So today might be a really good day to start. And because trust is personal, the repair efforts can't be effectively delegated. So if, if I'm the one responsible, I really need to be the one taking the lead on trying to fix that trust issue. Um, I also think that despite what some kind of authors and trainers might suggest, there's no magic formula for repairing damage to trust. Uh, you know, at least in a labor management relationship. Um, it's also not a unilateral exercise. It really does require effort by both parties. So again, if I'm responsible or I, I've inherited some of the responsibility for damage, um, you also need to work with me to give me an opportunity to help do some of the repair. And in the meantime, expect that if you're doing B1 bargaining, it is going to be more difficult. Um, that lingering mistrust is going to be a barrier. Most likely, bargaining is going to require more resources. It's going to take longer. It's going to feel like you're being asked to make additional concessions. Um, and they may want verification methods that wouldn't otherwise be thought of if there wasn't that trust issue. And you might even feel insulted because you feel like it's excessive. Those are some of the common consequences of damaged trust. But again, you don't have to first fix the trust in order to then engage in effective negotiations. Um, so work at it. Definitely work at it because it's going to be important for mission. It's going to be important for your workplace relationships. Um, but bargain anyway, and and uh, don't don't delay bargaining because you feel feel like oh we first have to work on the trust. Thanks. Okay. Um, the next one I think probably maybe it's a policy question, and and then so maybe go to Tim uh, from the OPM perspective, and then perhaps. Uh, Bill and David have a take on it as well from a statutory perspective, but the question came in um, while we were chatting. Um, if management has uh, the responsibility to initiate a change, uh, and I don't think they mean change, but to negotiate B1 bargaining, um, or uh, is that the union's responsibility to request B1 bargaining? Um. I, I, 
I guess from a policy perspective, certainly, um, I mean, you, you know, we talked about three different scenarios uh, earlier. You know, you, you've got term collective bargaining agreements, um, th those kind of negotiations. You've got midterm negotiations, and you've got negotiations that might be a result where management's looking to change um, uh, working conditions. And uh, generally, I mean, the way the process works is, you know, the parties are exchanging proposals. Uh, you know, um, if it's uh, midterm, it's uh, or I and I, uh, what we typically call I and I, it's a union submitting proposals. Uh, I, I think really, it's really the obligation is for management to engage the union on B1 proposals from the union in, in good faith. Is from my perspective, I, I don't necessarily think that management's obligated to reach out and initiate B1 bargaining, but certainly if they're in the middle of term negotiations, if the union puts B1 proposals on the table, management is obligated under this policy to engage them in good faith with the goal of reaching agreement and same with all the other negotiations. Traditionally, management comes forward with the proposal first, if you're not in term bargaining, we wanna have a new travel system, for example. The union typically doesn't get to bargain that B1, which travel system is going to be purchased. The union's proposals would be B2 and B3, when it'll be implemented, how staff will be trained, what happens if staff makes mistakes using the new system. So it's the opportunity for the union to come forward with proposals. And at that point, then, if the parties are bargaining B1, the union could submit some B1 proposals also. And just to add, I mean, if, if let's say the agency is making a, a change that involves a B1 matter, regardless of the executive order, you still have to bargain under the statute over the impact and implementation, as Tim said, the yes. 7106 B2 and 7106 B3 matters. So it can come up in that way. Okay. And the follow up, I guess, to that, Michael, would be what if. Um, the parties agree to bargain B1 matters, but really just don't have the time to do what you suggested that they do. Kind of the next step. <laughs> so, um, there's, there's no magic formula here for success. Um, but thinking that we can invest little and get a lot out is not always a, you know, a proven formula for success. So even if the concept of success is subject to multiple interpretations, like you, you view the end game differently than I do, um, I would suggest that one or more representatives of management union maybe meet at the front end before you dive into negotiations and and at least try to accomplish a few things to assess the best way to, to be successful if your resources are slim, including your time. First, um, identify what the issue or the problem is you're trying to solve and be really specific if you can and try to define that issue or problem narrowly. Um, the more you bite off, of course, the more time it's gonna feel like it's gonna take. And that may be off-putting to one or the other parties. Um, so figure out, you know, what's what's the end game here? What's the question that you need to answer to be successful in your negotiations? Um, it can be more difficult than it sounds when I put it that way. It's different than just presenting a proposal to them. Proposal's fairly easy. It's that's no more than a means to the end. It's just one way, maybe your preferred way to accomplish something, but that something is what you really need to identify with each other. So, you know, an example, um, I might say, we need two people to do this job. Well, that's sort of like a proposal and it could be a B1 proposal. Um, so what's the job and why do you need two employees to do it? So the job may be planting trees and we need two employees on the job to 
uh, protect their health and safety from one party standpoint, because uh, those trees are heavy. And then um, from the other party standpoint, we want the tree to be alive after we're done planting it. So we need someone to hold that tree up as we're filling that hole with, you know, backfill uh, and whatever the, the tree needs to survive. Boy, I'm into house plants, into trees. Um, <laughs> trying to stay away from real workplace issues. We've got a theme. <laughs> <laughs> we want to stay alive here. Um, but peeling back the, the proposal, um, you know, the proposal, we need two employees. Um, we can discover that uh, there's a problem we're trying to solve to keep this tree from dying and to protect the health and safety of people doing the work. So let's first, number one, figure out what is it we're trying to achieve here? Because if we can make it focused and narrow, maybe it's not going to take the time that you're afraid it might otherwise take. Second, I suggest tell them what you care about. Uh, and what you care about most as you're trying, as you're thinking about negotiating a solution here. I mentioned earlier that something like if everything is important and nothing is important. Uh, so try to focus on like your top priorities. What's the most important thing we're trying to achieve here? We aren't going to be able to achieve necessarily world peace, but maybe we can, you know, get peace, you know, in this corner of the world. Um, so again, when time is something that's concerning you, narrow the boundaries of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, the third thing I'm thinking of that can help you deal with this time issue is to share information with each other uh, about the issue you're trying to solve and share more than you have to. Seriously, share more than you have to because transparency helps your bargaining partner have confidence in the legitimacy of what you're trying to accomplish and helps them work with you to explore possible solutions. And so the more you reveal to them, the more that they may realize, oh, maybe we have more in common than we thought. And this isn't going to be that hard. Um, oftentimes, information in distributive bargaining is handled like um, power. You give them more information, you're giving them power, and then they're going to do damage to you. Um, so once we get out of that mindset, it makes it easier to share appropriate information. And then it makes it easier to realize, you know what, it's not going to be as hard as we thought it would be. I think that those three things can make a big difference. Um, and you can accomplish it in a relatively short period of time, especially once you get some experience doing this type of bargaining, it's not going to be that big a deal. Um, if you still determine that you don't have enough time to be successful, either lower your expectations and further limit your scope or develop some kind of plan B. Think of ways to be successful in a shorter period of time. Like one example is um, to extend the planned implementation date. All right, we don't have enough time to get it done here, but maybe we can get it done if we extend that date out a little bit. Or bring in a skilled facilitator, someone who can help manage your process more effectively and help you speed up so that you can overcome some of those barriers uh, to making decisions and getting them implemented. So those are just a few of the things I think you can do if you feel like time is going to be a problem. Okay, well, I think that um, we've talked about all the questions that came in during the presentation, but I know that sometimes as we've spoken to one another, there may be certain things that our colleagues have said that have prompted new thoughts or things that I might have missed. So I wanted to turn it back over to everybody to see if there were anything that they wanted to reiterate or, um, you know, just notes that they had been thinking of while we were all talking. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start first. Uh, just again, as a reminder, uh, you know, from the policy perspective, 
you know, it's it's important that agencies do engage with unions on the B1 bargaining. Um, and notwithstanding, you know, the statutory language, there is there is policy by the president on this. Uh, and uh, to, again, go, try to reach agreement in good faith. Uh, you do not have to agree to uh, either side to proposals that each side is making, but certainly have a goal to reach that agreement and seek third party FMCS and impasses panel assistance. Uh, you know, the goal here is not to penalize uh, unions for uh, taking something to impasse. Uh, the expectation under this policy is if impasse is necessary, then the party should go to impasse and get an impasse panel decision. I'd like to come in um, and, and reinforce what Michael Wolf said. There's so much wisdom in your following his approach um, in terms of communicating with each other, in terms of trying to figure out each other's interests, in terms of being upfront with what your interests are and what your goals are. Um, both because it's going to result in more agreements on more matters, which is one of the purposes of the statute and the relationship that you have. Um, but also because in the situations where you're not able to reach an agreement, you're going to be in a better position regardless of which side you're on when you wind up dealing with the third party neutrals. If you wind up before the OGC and a bad faith bargaining allegation, the test, the legal test is the totality of the circumstances. We are going to be able to better understand if bad faith bargaining occurred, if we can see lots of communications going back and forth with higher levels of communication beyond Here's our proposals, we reject your proposal. Similarly, if you wind up, as Tim Curry just mentioned before, the Federal Service Impasses Panel, um, you're going to be in a better position if they can read the documents that you've created and understood, not just your positions that you accepted or rejected or that the other side accepted or rejected, but the reasons why, what your interests were, what principles you were standing on, what fears and concerns you had with the other side's proposals. So. All of this is embodied in what Michael Wolf was talking about in terms of the way you approach each other and conduct these conversations, these, this bargaining. It does take more time, it does may take more energy, but at the end of the day, it can both provide you better results up front um, in terms of agreements and put you in a better position if you wind up dealing with a third party. And if I could build on what Bill just said a little bit, um, I was asked before, well, in part, uh, can we do this if one party wants to do distributive and the other wants to do integrative? My short answer was no. However, let me add a however there. Because if you're a skilled negotiator, even working in a distributive model, you can use integrative bargaining skills to accomplish some really important things at the bargaining table. So you don't have to do full-blown integrative negotiations in order to use uh, the integrative bargaining skills that you might have learned. Um, when, I when I mediated uh, private sector matters uh, while I was with FMCS, I remember one negotiation in particular involving the worldwide shipping arm of a large oil company. And uh, here they were all at the table trying to bargain, and it was a very distributive bargaining model um, to govern the labor relations and the collective bargaining agreement for all these people working on the large tankers going you know, around the world. And the employer's labor relations director was the most masterful negotiator I think I've seen almost at any time. He was very distributive, but he had these amazing integrated bargaining skills, knowing how to find out other people's interests, like what do they really care about, and how to shape bargaining proposals and solutions and possibilities in the most masterful way. So, he was a great example of how you can integrate these um, skills and these approaches uh, in ways that uh, can make you far more successful than if you thought of them just as 
one or the other. They don't have to be. So bring your full skill set to the table, no matter what kind of bargaining you're doing, and be masterful about it. David, any last thoughts and impressions? I guess just that, first of all, I, I think that this stuff is not easy in terms of the law, especially. Um, 7106 of the statute is probably one of the most complicated provisions of law that I've ever seen. So I, I appreciate that it's not easy. I think that if you're trying to figure out whether something is a 7106B1 matter, it's good to look at the authorities' tests, to look at the authorities' case law, to look at the, the party's arguments in a particular case, because there are cases where, for example, the authority has said something is 7106B1 because it wasn't disputed um, or wasn't uh, B1 because, you know, there was, there was uh, a claim that it wasn't, and that was undisputed, or the agency in a particular case didn't really explain the tie to the mission of a particular alleged uh, method or means. So it's really sort of look at the tests, look at the case law, but also look at what people are saying uh, to the authority, because the authority is not gonna invent arguments for parties typically. Um, so I would say, if you're trying to figure out what whether something 7106B1 uh, keep all those things in mind and, you know, think it through, uh, use your, your reasoning skills and, um, you know, it's not easy stuff, but there, there are things to look to. So. I, I want to thank everybody for joining us today in uh, this training on protecting the federal workforce and bargaining over matters under 7106 B1 of the federal service labor management relations statute. And Executive Order 14003 does reinforce the President's commitment to encourage union organizing and collective bargaining and to reset labor management relations across the executive branch. So the requirement for agencies to engage in collective bargaining on 7106B1 matters is an important way for federal workers to have their voices heard in their workplaces. So we hope you did find this training to be useful as we take all steps together to improve labor management relations across the federal government. On behalf of the Office of Personnel Management, I would like to thank FLRA Chairman Ernie DeBester and Acting General Counsel Charlotte Dye for their active support of this training. And as a reminder, as we noted a few minutes ago, today's complete session will be available for later viewing on the FLRA's YouTube page in the future. And based on questions raised in this training, uh, the FLRA will be creating a frequently asked question sheet, which will be posted soon on FLRA's website at FLRA.gov. And if you have any questions about the president's policy for agencies to engage in collective bargaining on 7106 B1 matters, please email me and my team at OPM at awr at OPM.gov. That's awr at OPM.gov. And thank you for your support of collective bargaining in the executive branch.